Hey guys, this is Ron. So this is video 14C uh, in our Rediscovering C programming language series. All right, so that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, but essentially 14C, uh, we'll be discussing multi-threading uh, in the C programming language. So 14A, we just kind of high level discuss uh, concurrency and how we can achieve some bit of concurrency um, with uh, fork and with pthread, or in our case, pthread, but really threads. Video 14B, uh, we used fork in order to create a child and parent, uh, where those were two totally separate uh, processes with their own memory space. Today, uh, we'll create uh, threads, which are lightweight processes, but they share memory space in between them. So now we have to worry about any time there's a, a resource uh, that multiple threads may be accessing, we need to protect it in some manner. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we're going to be using P threads, right? So there's different threads that we can be use on Linux. Uh, today, we're going to use P threads. It's what I'm used to using, so that's what I'm going to go with, right? So I've pointed out man seven p threads. So in the manual pages, um, man seven p threads gives a, a fairly large kind of write up about threads uh, and in particular threads on Linux uh, and how these are POSIX threads. It talks a little bit about you know what's shared in between them, so on and so forth. Um, what some of the functions return, um, thread IDs, and how they're you know done. We'll be using the pthread create, but we can also use pthread self uh, so that a thread itself can find its own thread ID. Um, and while it doesn't really need that, it's kind of nice for us to print it out from time to time so that we can kind of see that, oh, this is a separate thread, so on and so forth. But in practice, not hugely useful. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out, if we keep sliding down, um, here it talks about certain functions are thread safe, certain functions are not thread safe. Um, and so using certain functions, we can get some weird stuff if multiple um, threads are calling those functions at one time. So these should be uh, thread safe functions, whereas uh, like Functions like stir toke are definitely not thread safe, and so you have to be careful when you use stuff like that. Um, if I keep sliding down, keep sliding down, keep sliding down, it talks a little bit about uh, p threads uh, and NPTL, native Pos POSIX thread library. So there's some discussions in here about you know which one Unix or Linux uses, which ones it doesn't use. Um, not going to get into that because it's really not going to change how we implement things today. But I last thing I wanted to point out um, in here is that in order to compile threads on Linux, uh, we need to make sure we link in the pthread library. Okay. So in order to do that. I've updated my make file. So if I cat out my make file, what we'll see is I've added an extra line in here. And this is LD libs. So this is a, an environment variable that's basically gonna pass into our compiler uh, to link in, which is why you see the tack L, the pthread library, okay? And so as we compile, uh, you'll see that this uh, tack L pthread gets added to it. And that, again, tells the linker to bring in the pthread library. Okay, so let me close out of that. One thing I would like to point out as well um, is there are additional packages that you can install down here to bring in additional documentation, so additional man pages. Um, by default, with this Ubuntu 2004 box, I did have man pages for uh, pthread create. But I did not have um, man pages for the pthread mutex uh, functions, right? 
So by installing those packages, I brought in the, the additional documentation for these new texts, all right? Okay, so pthread create is how we're gonna create a new thread. And pthread join is how we'll wait on a thread to finish, right? So in our case, we're gonna run through an example of where I have the main thread, the main program, essentially is gonna kick off a bunch of other threads to do some type of work. Um, and then it's gonna join on each one of those threads. And so it essentially stops at that point, waits for that thread to finish, and then goes and joins on the next thread, waits for that thread to finish, so on and so forth until it knows all of the threads are finished and it will close out the program, all right? So pthread create and pthread join. So let's jump into an example uh, for this. I'm probably gonna do a little bit of copy and paste on this video just cause it's uh, 10.30 at night already. Uh, and I have to get up uh, for work in the morning. So let's kind of get into it. We'll call this um, read files. Okay. And so in here, we're going to bring in a couple different libraries. And I'm just going to copy and paste in these libraries. Okay. So stdio uh, is our library that we've been using to use printf and stuff like that. Uh, standard lib we're going to bring in in order to use functions like malloc. Uh, so we're going to uh, go ahead and allocate some space. We have our pthread uh, header file that is going to give us pthread create and so on and so forth. Um, and then string.h. Um, if memory serves me right, I think I needed it, but maybe this is left over from another example. But Let's go ahead and kind of jump into it. Uh, we'll do int main. Uh, and in this case, I am going to allow uh, some file names to be specified on the command line. So we'll do a int arg c char star star arg v. All right, so these are gonna be our command line options. And then I'm gonna just copy and paste a couple of, um, couple of things here. These are basically variables that I know that I'm going to need. All right, so first thing first is I'm going to get the number of uh, things that they specified on the command line. So the number of file names, right? Uh, I'm also going to have some type of result. And then here, I'm going to specify a pthread underscore T, right? So this is a type def that the pthread library made. Um, and then I'm just gonna call it threads. So a pointer uh, called threads. And so if we look, if we do a man on pthread create, we'll see that yes, we had to bring in our pthread h library. Uh, and what does pthread create take? Well, first off, it takes a pthread, right? So a pointer to a thread. It takes in some type of attribute. And in most cases, we're just gonna pass in null, right? And that essentially means give me the default attributes for this thread. Well, what kind of attributes could we specify? Well, there's multiple things and I've rarely ever had to use it, uh, but essentially uh, we could look up what a pthread attribute init does. Um, and hopefully it would let us know what the struct looks like. Um, but I know there's things in there like if you want to automatically create a thread that's detached, meaning that um, you know our main program doesn't necessarily have to wait on it to finish. This thing's gonna go off, do what it needs to do, and the main program doesn't need to kind of track it anymore. Um, and that's probably a terrible explanation for it. Um, but again, in almost every case that I've used pthreads, I've passed in null because I've just accepted the defaults. Now this might look a little bit odd if you've never uh, done a function pointer before. So essentially this is the function that as the thread starts, it's going to kick off this function. That's where it's gonna do its work, right? And so this is a pointer to a function and this pointer will return a void star pointer, so a generic pointer, and it will take in 
a void star pointer, which is again, just a generic pointer. So I can pass in a pointer essentially to anything, right? And then this last thing is an argument, right? So this is the argument that's going to get passed in to this function, right? So I can pass anything I want in here. It just needs to be a pointer to something um, and I can do that. In our case, we're gonna put like a file name in here, right? So this is the file name that we're going to pass to our function that our thread is gonna execute, right? So again, it takes a pthread underscore t uh, pointer. So we have our pthread underscore t threads so I'm gonna end up spinning up multiple threads based upon the number of files they send me. So if they list five files, I'm gonna spin up five threads to go deal with those five files, right? So let's go on. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we actually got arguments, right? So I'm going to, uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and just specify something, right? So we'll do if two is not equal to, well, if argc equals one, then they didn't hand me anything and I'll do um, p error. So this is the same thing as f printf error. Um, but it automatically sends this to standard error. And we'll just say, uh, we'll print out a usage statement. Um, we'll say this is supposed to be, what did I call this? I called this read files. And I will put in file name. And I think dot, dot, dot means that you can put in multiple file names, right? Something like that. There's probably a nice standard that I'm screwing up, but we'll go with that for now. And we'll just return ones and we'll be done. So assuming we've gotten at least a file in, uh, we'll go ahead and proceed. So the first thing I'm gonna do is allocate some space for the number of threads uh, that I'm gonna spin up. So I know that number of files should be, you know, some positive number, right? So I can use that. So let's, I'll just go ahead again, copy and paste. I'm trying to save a little bit of time, uh, your time and mine, but we're going to go ahead and malloc. Uh, I'm doing size of threads. So this thing that it points to, right, is a P thread T. So this is going to be the size of a P thread T and then times the number of files, right? So the number of file names that they've given me, that's the number of threads I'm going to spin up. And then I'm gonna make sure that, you know, I was actually able to allocate it, right? Otherwise, if, you know, malloc fails, it should return null. So if we return null, hey, you're unable to allocate for threads and we'll return, right? So we now have uh, a bunch, uh, or at least we have allocated space for all of these threads, right? We haven't created them, but we've allocated space for them, right? So let's just go ahead and start a for loop, right? So I've already have uh, some type of index value up here. So I'll just do four i equals zero i less than number of files i plus plus. All right. So inside my loop here, I'm going to say uh, I should probably have some type of result so that I know whether or not my, or I do have a result there. Um, but that's a void star result. So let's just do uh, int, uh, we'll call this uh, ret. It's a terrible name, but whatever. We'll just say ret equals uh, pthread create. Here I'm going to pass in a pointer to my uh, p thread. So in this case, this is going to be the address of threads, and I'm going to select the first thread, right? So I've allocated for the number of files, which means I've allocated for uh, z uh, one or more 
threads. So by using I, I'm selecting that individual thread inside of that threads essentially array, right? And then I'm passing in the address of that thread to pthread create, right? And so it will then fill in uh, that with information about the pthread, all right? So the next thing I need to pass in, if I look at my man page, is the attribute. So in my case, I'm just gonna pass in null. I'm gonna accept the default. And now I need a function pointer, right? So I need some type of function. So let's say we were gonna call our thing read files, right? Uh, or read file, right? So we're gonna have a function called read file and I'm gonna pass in the address of that function. And then what do I want? for my argument, right? So for my argument, here's where I'm gonna pass in whatever they gave me on the command line. So argv. So we got argv i, right? So I should start at zero. So this should probably be i plus one because the, the zeroth argument is the uh, file that they executed. So in our case, read files. And then i plus one, so that uh, one, index one, is the actual first thing they specified on the command line, all right? So I hope that wasn't too confusing of an explanation, but essentially we're passing in our thread or a pointer to our thread, uh, null for attributes, a pointer to our function by doing the address of our function name, and then we're passing in a uh, whatever they gave us on the file or on the command line, right? And then we'll do if uh, zero is not equal to ret, uh, we'll say p error unable to create thread. And we'll just keep going. We're just gonna note that we had a problem and we'll keep going and see what happens, right? More than likely we should be able to create this and shouldn't have an issue, right? All right, so let us see. Let's go ahead and assume that has all been successful. Then we're gonna do another for loop. And here's where we're gonna join on, uh, was this num file or num files? This was num files. And this decided, scroll wheel decided not to work. So num files. Not right there, how about right there? Num files. Num files. I plus plus. And here we're just gonna do a pthread join. And here we're gonna do the same kind of thing we did before. We're gonna pass in threads. We're gonna select an individual thread. And then we're gonna pass in the address of that individual thread, all right? And if I look, uh, man pthread join takes two arguments. The second one is a, uh, a void star star return value. So we're gonna have to pass in the address of a pointer as our return value. And so this is how uh, when our thread uh, exits, it passes some type of return value back to the main thread uh, under this join. So I've already created uh, a void star result. And so I'm gonna pass in the address of that result. So address of result. So result was already a pointer. I'm passing in, passing in the address of that pointer. So essentially I've made a void star star result, a pointer to a pointer, right? All right, and so what I can do here is if result, we'll say null is not equal to result, then I could validate that through each loop. So we could do star result equals null. So then I call pthread join. That should fill in the result. So assuming that uh, result isn't equal to uh, null, we know that the function actually returned something. 
and we're gonna assume it's gonna return us a string and so we'll let's let's just print it out so print f and we'll say uh, percent s and we will then pass in char star so we're gonna cast it as a uh, char star result right and did I close out? I did not. All right. So if we get a result back, go ahead and print it as if it was a string, essentially. All right. And then we'll return zero. We need to go ahead and free our uh, threads because we alloc uh, we allocated for our thread. And we'll close out. All right. So we're almost done. The only thing we need to do, assuming I haven't made a bunch of typos along the way, is we need to build this function, right? This read file function. So I'm gonna go to the top and let's build out the prototype for it out here. So it's void star. We'll call this read file and it's gonna take in a void star, All right? So done. We're gonna yank that, come back to our bottom paste that in so we have this return of a void star we're calling it read file we're taking in void star all right and what does this need to look like so we're going to assume the thing again that gets passed into read file was the file name that the user specified when they ran the program so the first thing we're going to do is do a char star file name equals char star and we'll call this arg all right and this becomes arg right so we're calling the thing they passed in arg we're casting it as a char star and resaving it under a variable called file name all right so let's go ahead and build some type of buffer char star buffer And I am going to copy and paste a little bit here just to save on a little bit of time because it is getting late. All right, so all I've done is I created a buffer that is null currently. Um, I'm going to say that that buffer is gonna be at least 200 bytes long. Uh, I'm gonna record the number of bytes that I read from this file. I'm gonna create a file pointer that will get filled in when I open this file. Um, and then I'm gonna create a pthread uh, thread up here, just kind of like we did up there. But what I'm filling it in with is pthread self. So now we can figure out the ID number of this thread. And I'm only doing that just because I wanna be able to print it out so you can kind of see um, you know, that in action. All right, so the first thing I need to do is um, I can uh, allocate for my buffer or I can open the file. So in my case, I'm gonna go ahead and open the file so that if it fails, there's no reason to allocate a buffer that I'm gonna have to clean up as well, right? So I'm gonna paste this in. So I've got F open, my file name, open it in read mode. So now I have a file pointer. And then I'm gonna to test to make sure that file pointer is a valid pointer. And if not, I'm gonna go ahead and exit returning null uh, instead, All right? So here, let's go ahead and allocate for my buffer. So buffer equals calloc. So I'm gonna zero it out. I'm gonna do buffer size. So if you remember, calloc takes the size and then the number of characters. Um, so this is the number of characters, and then the size is size of char, all right? And so that should allocate for my buffer. I'm gonna do if null equals buffer. So I know that something went wrong. I'll do uh, uh, p error, error, enable to allocate buffer. Turn. I can do a p thread exit. 
of null. So I think the difference between just returning null and pthread exit null, if I look at man pthread exit, pthread exit function terminates the, the calling thread and returns a value via retval, which is what I'm passing in here. Uh, that if the fret thread is joinable is available to another thread in the same process that calls pthread join so right so our thread is exiting it's returning uh, retval um, and then it's allowing the main thread to join on it right so the main thread will wait until this exits so on and so forth right so I can do that or I can just do a return from this function uh, but pthread exit works just fine okay so I have opened the file I've allocated a buffer and now I'm just gonna go ahead and read in um, I'm gonna read in some bytes right so I'll copy and paste this in and so I've got f read I'm reading into my buffer the size of a character buffer size minus one so that uh, I always have at least a null byte at the end because I did calic, so I know they should all be zeros. So by reading in one less than the size, I'm at least guaranteed that last byte will always be zero. So I null terminate my null terminate my uh, string, right? Um, in this case, we're only doing 200 bytes, but we could increase this. Uh, I don't really care that I may not read the entire file. I just the whole point was to see it read a file in a different thread and return it back, okay? File pointer, right? So this is where I'm gonna read from. I'm gonna go ahead and close the file now that I've read from it. And then I'll print out, hey, uh, this thread, because I've got my thread ID from before, uh, read in a certain number of bytes from a file, right? And so if everything worked right up to that point, all I should have to do is I could do pthread exit, I could do return, so we'll just stick with pthread exit in this case, and we'll say we're gonna return our buffer. Now, it's important to note one thing, right? If I were uh, to have created this buffer on the stack, meaning instead of doing uh, an allocation on the heap using calic or malloc if I would have created just a an array here and then tried to return that the problem is is this gets destroyed after uh, this function ends and so the return going back to the main function will be a basically invalid memory space right and so I'm placing my buffer on the heap because the heap doesn't go away when the function returns, right? Okay, so that's important to note that the return value is not something on the stack. This memory space exists on the heap. Um, and so it doesn't disappear when the function returns, right? So let's go ahead and save that. And assuming I've done everything correctly, we should be able to build this file, right? So, I have something called uh, readfiles.c. So I'll do make read files. And I did make some errors, so it looks like. So let's see. Um, in my for loop, I put a comma instead of a semicolon there on line 33. So 33, yep, sure enough. So we'll replace this with a semicolon write it again clear we'll make it i've made more errors because that's how i i roll uh let's see invalid use of void expression let's see uh line 34 it says dereferencing a void star pointer uh, let's see it just needed to be result equals null not star result all right what's well, the next one p thread t so join unlike create so man p thread create this one took a pointer 
right? So a pointer to a thread, whereas p thread. Oh my goodness, p thread join is just the thread, not a pointer to a thread. I think they do that on purpose just so that they can laugh at you when you do it wrong, all right? Because why would we, you know, do that? All right, so let's try to do this again. Make read files. Sweet, so it compiled. Notice when it did compile, there's that uh, linking in of the pthread library, okay? Important. And so then we'll just go ahead and run it. And so it tells us right away that uh, I'm supposed to specify file names. All right, so let's do file one. Okay, so file one, one string came in, one thread was kicked off. It read in 21 bytes from file one. It returned that string back to the main thread and the main thread printed it out. So it works, cool. File two, so notice we brought in two files and so it kicked off two different threads. Our thread IDs are different. And then it read in the contents, returned those back to the main thread. The main thread joined on thread or the first thread, printed it out, joined on the second thread and printed it out, All right? So we're seeing a pattern here. However, if I specify even more files, what I should see is that, okay, so I passed in file one, file two, file three. So this should be the first thread, second thread, third thread, fourth thread, fifth thread, but look what happened. We got our first thread kicked off, second thread kicked off, fifth thread kicked off, then fourth thread, then third thread. So the order that these, these essentially are uh, lightweight processes out executing on their own and it's up to the operating system to determine who gets time on a processor core you know whatever right there's no guarantee now which one will execute in which order it will execute so back in video 14a you know i tried to stress that you know we're decomposing our program into smaller bytes to where you can execute those sections of our code potentially out of order, but still get a valid result, right? So here we see that although they all executed the same function, they executed them in a different order. First thread, second thread, fifth thread, fourth thread, third thread. But the result is, is that they all read in a separate file. It all got put in a buffer. And then when the main program joined, it joined on those threads in order. So it printed out from thread one, from thread two, then thread three, then thread four, then thread five, right? So they printed these out in correct order because that's the order in which the main thread joined on all of the other threads. But the threads themselves that actually went out and did the work of reading the file, allocating a buffer, writing the data from that file into the buffer, those got executed in a different order. And that may be okay, right? Or it may not be okay, right? Depending upon how your program is composed. So I think it's important to note that, you know, when you create a bunch of threads, there's no guarantee what order those threads will be in. We only created five threads, really small number of threads. And already we can see that, hey, my computer decided, you know, to execute it in what order, you know, whatever, all right? So again, no guarantee about the order that they'll be executed in, but we are able to spin up five different threads to read five different files at the same time, read the, the contents into some type of buffer and return it back to our main program, okay? So cool stuff, right? So that was just reading from a file, but it could have been reading from a socket. It could have been any number of things. It just depends on, uh, you know, what your program is, is supposed to do. Okay, so that is creating, joining. Uh, what we can do uh, is we can do a Valgren uh, dash dash leak check full. 
So if you've seen some of my other programs, uh, whenever I use dynamic memory by using uh, Calic or Malloc or something like that, I always like to make sure that I run Valgrind on it to make sure I'm executing cl cleanly. And so apparently I'm not execu executing cleanly. Um, and so what we can look at is uh, what is uh, on 59. So apparently on 59, I do something. So I allocated a buffer. Oh, I allocate a buffer. I return it back to my main program, but then I don't actually free that buffer. So we know if we, uh, let's see, I join. If I have a result, I print it, which means I also need to free result. And I can take this and I can paste that in there. So assuming I've gotten a result back, I'm gonna free the result. I'm gonna set it back to null, all right? Uh, da -da. Probably doesn't matter if I do it in there. I'll leave it back here again, just so that I can guarantee coming in, it's also null, which I know because when I created it above, it was null, but just to be on the safe side, we'll go ahead and make our file again, run Valgrind. Okay, cool, 27 allocations, 27 frees, all heaps were freed, no leaks are possible. So our program executes, this time, you know, all of our files kind of came in. Uh, Valgrin tends to slow things down. Um, and so before we could even join on the first one, uh, each of our threads had finished, but it finished in one, four, two, three, five, right? So it's slightly out of order, but um, Valgrin slows things down. So the reading of the file and joining on it, just a little bit out of order. But point is, is that, you know, we were able to do that in five different threads we did it uh, with memory safety, um, and there's no guarantee about the order that these will execute in, but we're guaranteed we're gonna join in this way because again, this is a for loop that does the joining, right? So we would expect that that for loop is gonna do it in order. Cool, cool. So I'll go ahead and quit that out. Now, there are times where we may have a shared resource in between uh, our uh, threads. And that shared resource needs to be protected. So I have another program out here that I've already copied uh, or written here called uh, increment. So let's take a look at it. It's nothing special, right? Nothing special at all. So I'm bringing in a couple different packages. The important one here obviously is the pthread library. Um, I have a function pointer, right? So this is the function that each of the uh, threads is going to, to do. Uh, and so I'm calling this increment. And then there's this global variable called count. And so the whole point of this program is that as threads spin up, they come up, they'll increment count, and then they'll return, right? So what does this look like? So if I slide down, this looks fairly similar to what we saw before. Um, in this case, Instead of bringing in file names, I'm going to bring in a number, and that's the number of threads that I want spin up. So I could say 100. So I should see 100 uh, threads spin up, increment this variable, and that variable should equal 100 when it's all said and done, right? And so I have my P threads. Um, I first go ahead and check the command line, right, to make sure that they actually pass something in. I'm going to use stir toll in order to convert that into a long integer, right? So my thread count. Do some error checking in here to make sure I actually got uh, a valid number. I'm going to use thread count to malloc that number of threads. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and loop across them and I'm gonna go ahead and create them. So if I had specified 100, threads should be 100. Um, or correction, uh, thread count should be 100. 
this should hold all the uh, address space for all of those hundred threads. I'll loop across that a hundred times, creating a hundred threads that will all uh, execute the increment uh, function. I will then join on those threads, throwing away any result. I don't care about it. And then I'll print out what count is currently equal to, right? And all increment does is say, hey, go ahead and increment count and then return, right? I have this unused thing in here just so that the compiler doesn't complain that I didn't use arg, right? So this is a, a define that basically just set, makes this like a void function. So if I look up here at this define, so this technically is arg and arg then you know, basically becomes a void. It gets cast as void, right? So the whole point is, is that uh, this does, it makes it look like this does something and the compiler no longer throws a fit that, hey, you have this variable you didn't use. So this does nothing, right? The whole point is it spins up, it increments count and returns. And so when all of the threads have spun up, incremented count, joined so now they're all done i go ahead and print out count and so if i've spun up 100 threads i should see count equals 100 if i spin up a thousand threads i should see count equals a thousand right so we'll do a make increment all right make increment all right and if i put in 100 in fact, I do get count equals 100, right? And this looks like everything's working fine. What if I do count equals 1,000? Well, it looks like it works fine. So looking good, looking good. What if I put up 10,000? Oh, wait a second. That's not 10,000. That's not 10,000. Oh, that's 10,000. That's not 10,000. So what we're seeing here is that as we spin up more and more threads and more and more threads are trying to update the same shared resource at some point there's a collision where two threads are updating it at the exact same time but only one of them gets recorded right and so you end up with a number less than the number we got right so we have we don't see any errors that oh i wasn't able to create a thread now if i do something like that, it should overwhelm my system. And yeah, so I'm seeing lots and lots of, couldn't create the thread. Um, so we just, it didn't allow us to create that many threads, but 10,000, we should be, we definitely able to create that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, right? So you're gonna have this issue in your program that most of the time everything works correctly but every now and then for whatever reason, it doesn't, right? And so we have a shared resource, we need to protect it. And so we're gonna protect it with this pthread mutex init or mutex lock, right? So the first thing we need to do is initialize our mutex and, and then we'll go ahead and use it. So let's go ahead vi increment dot c and we'll go ahead and create a global mutex so that all of the threads can access it from the increment function. So let's take a look at man pthread mutex in it. All right. So we've got pthread mutex uh, log. Here's mutex in it. Right. So it's going to take uh, pthread mutex t. So a pointer to that. Uh, some type of attribute and that's it, right? So let's go ahead and create our pthread mutex t And we'll just call this um, Mutex And we'll set it equal to null I probably need to actually have it as a full-on mutex not a pointer to a mutex so that there's space uh, that's 
automatically allocated for it. So we'll just set it as value zero. And then we'll go ahead and assuming that they've passed in all the command line arguments, good. Assuming that the numbers that they passed in are valid numbers, we're gonna go ahead and initialize. So pthread mutex init We'll pass in the address of our mutex, mtx, and we're gonna pass in null for the attribute. And what does this do? So it returns an integer. So we need to make sure that, you know, we were able to do that. And so we have this result up here. So let's go ahead and set it. And it probably returns zero. If I re... return value pthread mutex and it always returns zero uh, the other mutex functions return zero on success and a non-zero error code on error so mutex in it always returns zero well then there's no point in checking it i guess if it's always going to return zero all right so pthread mutex init all right so we've initialized our pthread and then inside of our function that they execute we're going to actually lock so if i come back up to the top i have a pthread mutex lock takes a pthread mutex and then if it's successful it you know should return zero uh if it's not successful you know it should return something else so let's do uh int result uh we'll put this up there and we'll say result equals pthread mutex lock and we'll pass in the address of mtx all right so the whole point of this is that as a thread comes up it's going to attempt to lock the mutex if the mutex is already locked by another thread this essentially becomes a block for this thread and it will wait until the mutex becomes available and then it'll try to lock it again. And assuming another thread hasn't locked it in the meantime, if it locks it, then it will move forward. Otherwise, it sits there and waits until the mutex becomes available. All right, so uh, assuming result is uh, if zero is equal to result, We'll go ahead and increment our count. And then we'll go ahead and unlock pthread mutex unlock. Pass in our mutex, the address of our mutex. And then we'll return null. So again, we're going to go ahead and lock it. If we can't lock it, we're gonna wait there until we can lock it, and then we'll proceed down. If we were, uh, we got a, a, a zero success out of it, we're gonna go ahead and increment, unlock, and return, all right? So we've done that. The next thing we need to do, because we have an init, we have a lock, we have an unlock, we also have a destroy. So we have to destroy our mutex when it's done, right? So let's go ahead and come up here. At the point where we free our threads, this sure looks like a good time to also go ahead and destroy uh, our mutex. All right. So it looks like we pass in a pointer to our mutex. So the address of our mutex, we're gonna destroy it. We'll free our threads and exit, all right? So let's go ahead and make increment again. It worked this time. So we'll go ahead, execute a thousand. So we're good, we'll execute 10,000, we're good. Execute again, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. And now it looks like we're getting consistent results. So instead of periodically getting, you know, 
uh, 9,999, we're getting a consistent 10,000. Now this will be slightly slower uh, than it was before because now we have all these threads that are gonna basically wait for the lock to become available. When it does and they can lock it, they'll go ahead and increment, unlock and go. So now this lock will slow it down slightly, but we have 10,000 threads getting spun up to increment a shared variable and there's no issue with one thread stepping on another thread, right? Pretty cool. Um, and I'm sure Valgrin will probably throw a fit leak. Check equals full. It'll take a while because Valgrin slows everything down and I'm spinning up 10,000 threads that it has to keep track of. So this may or may not come back anytime soon. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we'll jump over here. We discussed uh, multi-threading. Uh, we looked at various places where we can get documentation from it. There's additional packages to install. Um, if uh, you don't have uh, the mutex portions, when creating the threads, we did create, and then we joined on them at the end. So we're waiting for that thread then to finish and return a value. We used the mutex in order to protect that shared resource to ensure that one thread doesn't try to update the resource uh, at this or at the same time as another thread is using it right and so there's other you know if we were using some type of queue system that might even create additional problems because we think we pull the same value out of the queue but it was only supposed to come out one at a time it could cause lots of different issues right so again we need to protect those things as we're using them and so the mutex comes in uh, super handy for that uh, remember when we're returning values from uh, from our threads, we need to make sure those values exist on the heap and not on the stack. Because if they're on the stack, when the function returns, that stack gets destroyed. So now you're basically passing an address to memory that you no longer own, right? So by doing it on the heap, it doesn't get destroyed right away. And so when you join, you can now utilize uh, that memory. Uh, but you need to remember to free it. So assuming this was returned, nope, it didn't return. So it took too long and something killed it, right? So probably just way too many threads. If I spin up 100, hopefully this time it'll finish. Um, so it did finish, 102 Alex, 102 free. So everything's running cleanly. It's just 10,000 threads into Valgrin. Valgrin just took too long and the process was killed. Okay. So I hope that was helpful for you to see threading. You'll use this all the time, especially when you start using um, sockets and you need to handle multiple connections because maybe you're writing the server application. Um, threading comes in super handy for that if you decide not to go down the route of forks. All right. So this video has gotten way too long. It's quarter after 11 and I got to go to work in a couple hours. So I'm going to cut it off right there. Uh, again, hopefully it was informative. And uh, if you watch this long, you're amazing, man. Appreciate it. All right. Bye.